أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على خير الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا الأولين والآخرين شفيع المذنبين رحمة للعالمين وحبيب إله العالمين ولا حبيب إلا هو وأهل الذي سمع في السماء بأحمد وفي العربي بأب القاسم محمد اللهم صل على ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المأثومين المذلومين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق ولاستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أرسلنا نوحا إلى قومه أن أنذر قومك من قبل أن يأتيهم عذاب أليم قال يا قوم إني لكم نذير مبين أن اعبدوا الله واتقوه وأطيعون يغفر لكم من ذنوبكم ويؤخركم إلى عجل مثمى إن أجر الله إذا جاء لا يؤخر لو كنتم تعلمون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه محمد وعلى الله إن شاء الله for the next several nights we will be discussing chapter 71 of the whole of Quran known as Surah Nuh Surah Nuh of course is named after one of the most important prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned within the whole of Quran and who is known to be the first of the Ulul Azm, meaning those most greatest of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. According to narrations of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, Prophet Nuh is known as the first Rasul. We go ahead and we take a look and we see that there are 124,000 prophets. But according to a narration, there are 313 Rasul, meaning that there's a differentiation between the term prophet and the term messenger. 124,000 prophets we have and 313 messengers. Every one of the messengers is a prophet, but not every one of the prophets are messengers. Messengers are those prophets who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selects for humanity to present a new sharia, to come forth with new legislation and with a, specific men, with a specific mission. While the other prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those prophets who come, they guide, they offer advices, they offer wisdom, they offer support toward the community that is living. The first one of these prophets to come forth with specific legislation and with a specific mission is Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. Amongst the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are Nuh and Ibrahim, and Musa, and Isa, and the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But for instance, when we go ahead and take a look at amongst, amongst those examples who are messenger, or who, who are just prophets, we see Adam Alayhi Salaam, Prophet Sheath, the prophets of Bani Israel. They don't come and they present new legislation, but rather they confirm what the prophets before them presented, and they offer advices and wisdom, and so on and so forth. Thus Prophet Nuh alayhi salam is the first messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we go ahead and we take a look, and oftentimes when we begin to reflect upon all of the different world religions that we have, the Western religions, Christianity, Judaism, and the religion of Islam, we always trace back our route toward Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. In the whole Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states about Ibrahim, inna min shi'atihi la Ibrahim that surely from the Shia of Nuh comes Ibrahim. Meaning that in reality, all of the religions can go back and trace their roots to Nuh alayhi salam. According to the narrations of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam lives for 2,500 years by the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he preaches toward his community for 950 years. And as we mentioned last night, that perhaps Nuh alayhi salam, at most, he has 800 followers in the midst of these 950 years of propagating the message. But more authentic narrations and the more common opinion 
amongst the Mufassireen of the whole Qur'an and scholars and theologians within the religion of Islam is that Prophet Nuh السلام, did not have more than 100 followers in the midst of these 950 years. According to the narrations that it states that Prophet Nuh السلام, he comes and he begins to preach his message toward a community of 800,000 people only. When we go ahead and take a look in comparison with the prophets, the latter prophets, like Isa, like the Holy Prophet wa, like the people who lived during the time of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt salam. Of course, population increases as time begins. And according to the narrations, Prophet Nuh salam, is the 10th prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His nine grandfathers were all prophets, and he was the 10th, and he, of course, is the first messenger, as you mentioned, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophet Nuh السلام, is mentioned upwards of 40 times within the whole Quran in more than 20 different chapters within the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And chapter 71 of the whole Quran, that chapter that we want to discuss inshallah for the next several nights, Surah Nuh, doesn't necessarily get into the details of the life of Prophet Nuh. But rather what it does is, is it presents toward us in majority a conversation between Nuh and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the grievances, the complaints, the du'a of Nuh, in the midst of all of this preaching toward the community, as we mentioned, most of the people rejected him. So Prophet Nuh was an individual who felt marginalized by his community. He thus he spent a lot of the time praying to Allah, seeking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala respite from this particular trial that he was dealing with. And according to the narrations of Ahlul Bayt, the name of Prophet Nuh is not actually Nuh. His given name was Abdul Ghaffar or Abdul A'la or Abdul Karim, the slave of the All Merciful, the slave of the All High, the slave of the All Forgiving, and so on and so forth. But the name that has been attributed toward him is Nuh or Noah as, as it is found in the Hebrew Bible. In the Arabic language, the word Nuh means someone who is constantly weeping, someone who is constantly grieving. And this title was given to this particular prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for two reasons. The first reason is that he would always be weeping and always be grieving for the fact that he was marginalized from his community. He would cry and he would weep and he would pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove him from this difficulty. And a second reason why he would weep and a second reason why he would grieve is because he himself was in solitude for the majority of his life. No one came to greet him. No one came to talk to him. He lived a life of isolation. But that did not hinder Prophet Nuh السلام, from making his very best effort to constantly be preaching the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the message of the Tawheed, of God, and prophethood, and divine legislation. Furthermore, when we go ahead and take a look very briefly at the history of the life of Prophet Nuh السلام, Narrations come forth and they tell us that Prophet Nuh salam's community lived in the outskirts of the city of Kufa. Kufa, of course, is a very important and strategic location toward the school of Ahlul Bayt for, 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 for it is the capital of the government of Amir al-Mu'mineen And many of us have visited the mosque of Kufa, Masjid Kufa, when, we've gone, when, when we have gone for ziyara of Amir al-Mu'mineen of Ahlul Bayt salam, of Imam al-Hussein in Karbara. And when you go toward Masjid Kufa, you go forth and you see that there is a location known as the Maqam Nabi Nuh, the place where Prophet Nuh used to pray. And we go and we perform certain acts of rituals and a'mal and prayers in that particular location. Furthermore, when we go ahead and take a look at the history of Prophet Nuh السلام, we see that Prophet Nuh is buried in the city of Najaf. He is buried right next to the body of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam which is why when we go to the ziyarah of Imam Ali alayhi salam, in the ziyarah of Amir al-Mu'mineen, at the end of the ziyarah, we say, وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكَ عَلَىٰ ذَجِعَيْكِ آدَمَا وَنُوحًا عَلَيْهِمْ السَّلَامُ And peace be upon you, O, o Amir al-Mu'mineen. And after that, after we conclude the ziyarah of Amir al-Mu'mineen, and we say, and peace be upon those two companions of, of yours, Adam and Nuh, Prophet Adam and Prophet Nuh, according to our narrations, are buried right next to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And after we culminate with the ziyarah, it is recommended that whenever we visit any, holy, any member of the holy household, we pray turakat prayers and we gift the reward toward that individual. But when we go toward visiting Amir al-Mu'mineen we are told to pray six rakat of prayers. Two for Amir al-Mu'mineen, 
two for Adam, and two for Prophet Nuh And inshallah, over the next couple of nights, we will go ahead and take a look at certain anecdotes of the life of Prophet Nuh. We will reflect upon the story of the Ark and so on and so forth. But for today, we want to get a little bit of a glimpse into what exactly is this chapter of the Qur'an all about. Prophet Surah Nuh, chapter 71 of the whole Qur'an. Very briefly, before I get into the text of this particular chapter, according to the Mufassireen of the whole Qur'an, Surah Nuh is revealed in Mecca. Of course, we know that chapters of the whole Qur'an are separated into two cities of, revela- of two cities of revelation. The first city, of course, is Mecca, and the second city is Medina. Because for the first half of the life of the prophethood of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, approximately for the first 11 years of prophethood, he lives in the holy city of Mecca. And after that, of course, as we know, he migrates toward the holy city of Medina, where he receives the rest of his legislation. And when we are going to reflect upon the verses of the Holy Quran, it is extremely important for us to know where these particular chapters were revealed. Because they tell us numerous things about what is the essence of those chapters, or what is the essence of the verses that is within that particular chapter of the Holy Quran. For instance, whenever we go ahead and we hear that X chapter has been revealed in Mecca, we know that in Mecca, it is the beginning of the prophetic message. Thus the Holy Prophet ﷺ has certain responsibilities which he wants to achieve while he's in Mecca. He wants people to stop burying their daughters alive. He wants people to leave these aspects of immorality that they had during that period and allow themselves to believe in God, allow themselves to stop worshipping idols, allow themselves to start giving rights toward their family members, to their women, to their children, toward their slaves, and so on and so forth. Verses that were revealed in Mecca focus on God, focus on morality, focus on etiquette, and so on and so forth. While when we come to the verses of Medina, we see that all of the verses that speak about legislation, that speak about law, that speak about economy, they're all revealed in Medina. Because this is when the Holy Prophet ﷺ had established the Islamic State. And when I mean the Islamic State, I mean the Islamic State of Rasulullah. Not the Islamic State of these idiots that are living in the world today and using the name of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. That's the verses that are revealed in Medina. We come and we see that the Holy Prophet, he instructs people to pray. He instructs people to fast. He instructs people to go for hajj and give in charity and give in khums and so on and so forth. Thus, when we go back toward this particular chapter, chapter 71 of the Holy Quran, it is revealed in Mecca. According to the Mufassireen, in either the eighth year after the Ba'fa, after the Holy Prophet proclaims his message, or the ninth year. And coincidentally, or not coincidentally, the Mufassirin of the Holy Quran, they also state that in terms of the order of revelation, Prophet Surah Nuh is the 71st chapter of the Holy Quran, and in terms of order of revelation, Surah Nuh is also the 71st chapter that was revealed toward the Holy Prophet Let us go ahead and take a look at these verses of the Holy Quran, and if you desire to, it will be useful for you to follow along with me with your phones or with the Holy Quran in order that we get a little bit of insight into these verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Chapter 71 of the Holy Quran, Surah Nuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim. Of course, every one of the chapters of the Holy Quran, with the exception of chapter 9, begins in the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim. Inna arsalna nuhan ila qawmihi an andar qawmaka min qabl an ya'tiyahum adabun alim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by stating, Surely we have sent down Nuh toward his community. When we go ahead and take a look at this line, Inna arsalna Nuhan ila qawmihi, when it states, Surely we have revealed or surely we have sent down Nuh toward his community, what does it mean when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends something? There are different groups of theologians who have debated this particular concept within the history of the religion of Islam. For instance, one group of people, they come forth and they say, one group of Muslim theologians, they come and they state that the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he lives on his, he sits on his throne, his throne which is on the seventh heaven, and every single time that he desires to give a commandment toward the Prophet, he leaves the throne, he takes a couple of steps, and he walks down from the heavens closer toward the earth, and he begins to give or present the message toward his Prophet 
whom he has chosen to preach toward the community. In the school of Ahlul Bayt, of course, we reject this concept. For we state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond time, He is beyond space, He is beyond, he is beyond direction. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not sit on a throne. But when we do speak about the throne of Allah, it's symbolic of the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Inna arsalna Nuhan ila qawmihi, surely we have sent down Nuh toward his community. We see that Nuh preached toward this community of his, approximately 800,000 people in the city of Kufa. He lived with them for 850 years prior toward receiving the message that he should go ahead and preach the message or preach Tawheed toward this group of individuals. But how did Nuh alayhi salam receive the commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or by extension, how did Isa and how did Musa and how did Ibrahim and how did the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa receive this instruction to go ahead and preach toward the community now is the time. For instance, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he lives for 40 years before he proclaims the message. Nuh alayhi salam, he lives for 850 years before he proclaims the message. When we go ahead and take a look, for instance, at the story of the Holy Prophet, we go ahead and we remember the story when the Holy Prophet is sitting in the cave of Hirra and Jibra'il comes toward him and says, Ya Rasulullah, Iqra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told you to read and so on and so forth. And he receives the instruction to go ahead and begin to preach the message on the next day. When we come toward the story of Nuh alayhi salam or the other prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, perhaps there is an occasion when Allah sends down Jibra'il, the angel of revelation, to go toward the prophets and instruct these prophets to go ahead and preach the message. But other times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Inna arsalna Nuhan ila qawmihi, that Allah has sent down Noah toward his community that he preaches the message, it is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspires the prophet. He gives him a sense of understanding where he understands that it is now his obligation to go ahead and preach that message of God. Inna arsalna Nuhan ila qawmihi toward his community an anzir qawmaka min qabl an ya'tiyahum adabun alim. The responsibility of Noah in this particular moment is to go toward his community and warn them so that they do not receive the punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Question that we need to pose over here is why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only send Noah to remove this community from the punishment? Someone might state, isn't the responsibility of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide from people to guide people from darkness into light and so on and so forth? Yes, that's absolutely the truth. But the fact of the matter is that this particular community had 10 prophets sent toward them before Nuh alayhi salam. They went and they advised and they, for the most part, were receptive toward the prophets who had come before. But slowly they began to revert back to their old ways of worshipping idols, of living a life of complete vice socially, morally, with their families, with community, politically, economically, Everything was the antithesis of the morality presented by the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before Nuh alayhi salam. So when, when Noah, he comes toward the community, he goes toward them and he says, look, go back and revert back and reflect and know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's presented toward you this message with the prophets who preceded me. And now I am coming to warn you that if you do not follow the instruction that I am coming to present toward you, then you are also going to receive punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We go back toward the verse of the whole Qur'an, إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ أَنْ أَنْذَرْ قَوْمَكَ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَهُمْ أَذَابٌ عَلِيمٌ Surely the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes only after a warning. And that is something that we need to reflect upon for just a moment. When an individual, he wants to go and demonstrate his wrath or demonstrate his anger, or punish someone for absolutely no reason or without any sort of warning, this doesn't say much about that person who wants to inflict the punishment. If, for instance, I get angry at an individual in the community and I just go and I decide to throw a punch at him without any sort of warning, this has to do with my anger problem and probably with the fact that I have a lot of pride and a lot of jealousy and a lot of animosity toward that individual who I just threw the punch towards because I did not even give him a warning or tell him that I'm angry or tell him that I'm frustrated by the way that he or she is acting, for instance. 
But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to punish any community, He admonishes them first. He advises them first. He sends them prophet after prophet, guidance after guidance, revelation after revelation, warning them, advising them, telling them, hold on, step back, reflect, take a look at this world, take a look at all of the bounties, take a look at all of the blessings that you're dealing with. Before you go ahead and truly desire to go against my commandment, take a step back and begin to reflect. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving this community who has been known for vice, who has been known for bloodshed, who has been known for corruption, one more opportunity by sending them Prophet Noah, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, inna arsalna, nuhan ila qawmihi, an anbar qawmaka man qabl, an ya'tiyahum adabun alim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues in verse number two. Qala ya qawmi inni lakum nadhirum mubeen. Nuh alayhi salam, he goes toward the community and he says, O oh, my community, surely I am to you a manifest warner. Within these first two verses of chapter 71 of the Holy Quran, three times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the term qawm. Qawm in the Arabic language means community. Probably in the midst of these last 30 minutes that I've been speaking, I probably said the word community a hundred times, right? The stress on community in chapter 71 of the Holy Quran is unique toward this particular chapter. Why? Prophet Nuh salam preaches for 950 years. Right? 950 years, this community rejects him. They marginalize him. They mock him. They abuse him. They laugh at him. They do everything that we can imagine that, an indiv- that, that a community would potentially do toward an individual that they don't like. But what does Nuh do? Does he stop? Does he give up? Does he even complain? No. He continues pushing, striving, doing the best that he can to preach the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't get frustrated with people because they're not receptive toward the message. If an individual is not receptive toward, you know, Islamic practices, for instance, doesn't mean that automatically we reject this person, condemn him to hell, and that's it. No, we can't do that, right? This, these verses of the Holy Quran are instructions for all of us. When you see a family member, a community member, they're not religious. They don't come to the mosque. They're up to no good, drugs, alcohol, whatever it may be. You don't give up on people. You always offer them the ability to come back. You always give them the benefit of the doubt. You always provide them excuses because that's what community is all about. That's the responsibility of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they live amongst their, when they live in their civilizations. How about us when we live in ours? Isn't it our responsibility to walk in the footsteps of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But just imagine this for one moment. Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, he comes toward this civilization of his, this society that he's living in, and he goes toward them and he says, look guys, I have been sent down as a prophet, I have been sent down as a messenger. Naturally, how many people are going to be receptive tomorrow if Imam al-Mahdi enters into Mafal and he says, I am Imam al-Zaman, follow me, listen to what I have to say. You're going to be like, come on, bro. you got to be kidding me. Seriously, you, you look like this. We had a di- completely different picture of how the imam is going to look, perhaps, right? We didn't know you were going to talk like this to us. We didn't know that you were going to act like this, dress like this. We're going to present all of these numerous amount of excuses to remove burden from our back. Naturally, people of the past, they used to do the same thing. And as we mentioned yesterday, when we're reflecting on the whole of the Quran, what we need to do is put ourselves in those same footsteps of the people of Prophet Nuh, alayhi salam. If Prophet Nuh is going to come toward you, during that time, we're living during that time, we're living our life the way that we're enjoying it, we're comfortable, and all of a sudden he's like, look, this is what you gotta do. You gotta leave these idols and you gotta worship God. You have to pray, you have to fast, you have to go for hajj, you have to do all of these things. What's the potential that the majority of the people are gonna be receptive to what the Prophet has to say? Probably the majority of us, probably myself, are not gonna be receptive toward, this, toward what this guy has to say. But even though that the prophets of the past, they always built up years worth of integrity before they began to preach the message. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he goes toward the community after 40 years, after 40 years, then he goes toward the people of Mecca, the Quraysh, and he says, look, if I were to tell you that there is an army standing behind this mountain, would you believe me or no? They said, oh Muhammad, you are al-Ameen, you are al-Sadiq, you are the trustworthy, you are the truthful one. Of course we believe you. Then he says, then I am telling you that I am the prophet of God and I ask you to obey me. What do the people say after that? Muhammad, chill out, relax. 
We believe that an army is behind you, but we don't want responsibility. We're good where we are. We don't need anything else, right? Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, he has built up that integrity. The guy lived for 850 years, man, right? Their people's great grandfathers heard about this guy. He's lived for 850 years, a miracle of Allah, right? Now he's going to live for the next 950 years. As we mentioned, the narration says he lives for 2,500 years. All of these miracles that are completely evident in front of their eyes, what do the people say? Relax, man. We don't want responsibility, right? So he goes toward them, and he states, and he states, Allah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes him in verse number two, ya qawmi, he states, Ya qawmi, O my community, inni lakum nadirun mubin. I am telling you, and I am advising you, that I am a plain manifest warner to you. It is my job to warn you. It is my job to advise you. It is my job to present certain wisdoms toward you. How do they respond? They begin to laugh at him. They begin to mock him. They begin to state, look, we trust your integrity. We believe that you're a trustworthy person. We believe that you're a moral person. But you know, you're 850 years old. Maybe you're extremely old. So maybe you know we can't really listen to you anymore, right? Maybe you're, you know, they present all of these excuses because they don't want to submit to what he has to say. And we go ahead and we see that this arrogance has been founded with all of the prophets of the past. When we go ahead and take a look at the verses of the Holy Quran, the stories of Nuh and of Ibrahim and of Musa and of Isa and of the Holy Prophet The prophets, they come toward the community, but the people reject it. They begin to mock, they begin to laugh, they begin to call Prophet Muhammad a sorcerer, a magician, a poet when he presents the ayat of the Holy Quran. They want to refuse towards submitting toward that. And this is a custom of people throughout history, that whenever they don't want burden, they begin to make jokes. For instance, some of us, we're sitting in the mosque and we hear the sheikh come and tell you certain ahkam in regards to fasting. The ruling for fasting in regards to this particular point is this. And uh, ruling, number, ruling B is this. And ruling C is this. The first thing when we don't want to submit to it, even though we might believe that it's potentially the truth, is come on man. Does Allah really want that from us? I don't think that he does. Or you begin to make fun. We begin to make jokes. Why? An individual who's always mocking is an individual who we find demonstrates arrogance over what potentially may be the truth, right? The Imams of Ahlul Bayt, salam, they would go toward preaching toward their communities. Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam, he would time after time advise toward the community that look, I am the one who the Holy Prophet appointed as a, as a successor. They presented excuses because they don't want that burden of Amir al-Mu'mineen to rule over them. Imams al-Baqir, Imam al-Sadiq they would go and they would perform the tafsir of the Holy Quran, narrate uh, narrations of the Holy Prophet وسلم, preach toward the community, but everyone presented excuses because they failed to accept the burden. Let me give you one example. On the day of Ghadir, on the day of Ghadir, the Holy Prophet وسلم, he's standing in front of 100,000 people. He states the famous lines, "Man kuntu maula, fahada aliyun maula, Allahumma alwali man wala, waladi man ada, wansur man nasara, wakhdul man khadala." Of whomsoever I am the master, then Ali is the master. Then everyone raises their hands and they make the du'a, "Oh Allah, whoever loves Ali, then love him. Whoever supports Ali, then support him. Whoever is an enemy to an, whoever is an enemy to Ali, then be an enemy to him, and so on and so forth." Everyone is saying, "Ilahi amin." Everyone is making the du'a. After that, there was one man. He looks toward the Holy Prophet And he says, Oh Rasulullah, you have told us to believe in God and leave our idols. We left our idols and we believed in God. Oh Allah, oh, oh, oh Rasulullah, you have advised us that we need to follow you because you are the Prophet of God and we followed you. Oh Rasulullah, you told us to pray and we prayed. You told us to fast during the month of Ramadan, we fast during the holy month of Ramadan. You told us to go for the pilgrimage, we went for the pilgrimage. You told us to give 20% 20, 20 of our income in Khums, we've given that to you. Oh Rasulullah, are you telling us this instruction? Is it truly coming for God, from God that you have told us that Ali is the successor or is it coming from you? At this moment, the Holy Prophet ﷺ, perhaps some of the companions, they get angry at the man and they are about to scold him, about to beat him up. The Holy Prophet tells everyone to calm down and he says, everything that I say, it comes directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the problem with this man? He doesn't like Amir al-Mu'mineen. How many people within history didn't like Ali ibn Abi Talib? They didn't like the prophets of the past. 
They just didn't want to submit toward it because they were too arrogant to submit toward that particular law, that particular legislation. At this moment, the Holy Prophet says, everything that I say is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when I say that Ali alayhi salam is the successor after me, then this is the commandment that God has given me to explain toward you. At this moment, this individual, he turns his back toward the Holy Prophet and he says, oh God, oh Allah, if this is truly a commandment from you, then let the punishment descend on me right now and kill me. At that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the first verse of Surah Al-Ma'arij, Sa'ala sa'ilun bi'adhabin waqah. And at that moment, the punishment came from the skies and annihilated that individual. Arrogance is something very dangerous, especially when it comes toward the holy prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes toward the whole of Quran, when it comes toward the narrations of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. When we have these legislations presented in front of us, when we have commandments and instruction of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam presented in front of us, we shouldn't be so quick toward jumping to the conclusion of stating, you know what, this is probably not the law, this is probably not religion, right? We have to be careful. We have to state that we believe whatever Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam believe. Al-Qawlu minni, Qawlu Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad, fi kulli shay. We are told to state in a narration that my belief is the belief of Muhammad and his progeny in everything. Sometimes we don't understand the nature of angels or jinns or heaven or hell of the thro- or the throne of Allah or all of these different abstract, sublime, you know, uh, contexts and ideas and concepts. When we don't understand, we state whatever the Holy Prophet believes, I believe. Whatever Ali believes, I believe. Whatever Ahl al-Bayt they preached, that's what I preach. This is the steps that we need to take in order to demonstrate our absolute submission toward the divine guides. And these are some of the lessons that those individuals during the time of Nuh, they fail to submit toward, but we have to make sure that we are following suit, taking the lessons of the whole of Quran and doing our very best to make sure that we are those who submit toward the Prophet and the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have the tawfiq to reflect upon these verses of the whole of Quran from Surah Nuh in the upcoming nights. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the hastening of the reappearance of the Imam. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin.